morning, uh, good dawn, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be introducing to you this panel that focuses on our World Alzheimer's Report, which is launched today, the 2020 edition, which is on design, dignity and dementia. Um, I know that there is over 1,000 people registered for this webinar, so I am delighted that there is so much interest. I am Paola Berberino. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Alzheimer's Disease International, which is the global umbrella charity of 102 uh, Alzheimer's Association in just as many nations. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you today. And we would like to remind you that the launch of this report is within the context of World Alzheimer's Day, which is today, and a more widely of World Alzheimer's Month, uh, which is the month of September. With that in mind, I would like to remind you to uh, please uh, do as much social media as you can about World Alzheimer's Day, World Alzheimer's Month, and the World Alzheimer's Report. The campaign for this year is Let's Talk About Dementia. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, anything you want, but please do make your voice heard. It's only by making our voice heard that change will happen. So far, there's been over 12 million people that have engaged in the campaign worldwide. We can do better than this by the end of the month. So please help us make the voice of everyone living with dementia and their families heard around the world. Now, I would like to tell you all and announce that our uh, conference, Hope in the Age of Dementia, uh, which is the longest running conference worldwide on dementia and that is gonna focus on the seven areas of the Global Dementia Action Plan of WHO is going to run virtually in December. The reason why I'm telling you this in this webinar is in particular because we'll soon reopen the abstracts and we will have more abstracts coming in. One stand will be on COVID-19 and its impact. You all know that ADI has been extremely active during the COVID-19 pandemic. The second topic is the topic of this report, Design, Dignity and Dementia. We will be calling uh, to all of you for submission for the conference. Now, another piece of reminder, just to remind you that ADI is a charity. Uh, we would uh, welcome any kind of contribution toward our work. Our work is available freely to everybody in the world. Uh, but if you can make a donation, if you have that capacity, we would be very, very grateful. Thank you so much. Now, let's start in earnest. Before we start this webinar, we would like to hear from you. We would want to know who you are. So if you can please let us know. Um, my uh, wonderful team, Andy Bliss, is going to launch a poll right now. And you can vote for this poll and tell us a little bit more about you. I think the poll is not coming online, uh, so we are going to go ahead with the rest of the webinar and perhaps do the poll at the end if it works. So uh, we are going now to pass uh, the baton to the speakers. And first and foremost, the wonderful uh, Richard Fleming, who is the lead author of the report that you can see today. The report has been defined by some as a doorstopper. Well, that was our intention, or rather Chris Lynch's intention, uh, to make something that would be a reference book for the rest of the world on dementia and design. Um, following Professor Richard Fleming, we'll have Dr. John Zeisel and Kirsty Bennett, who are the report colleagues. Um, then we'll have Kate Woffa, who many of you will know, the CEO of Dementia Alliance International. Kevin Charas, who has written about human rights for the report. Wilhelmina Hoffman, uh, one of which interviews in the report is Wilhelmina on uh, the amazing things they have achieved in Sweden around design and dementia. Finally, we're gonna leave here from Ishtar Govia, who will tackle the important issue of lower and middle income country in design and dementia. And uh, the wonderful Alison Dawson will uh, conclude from the University of Sterling. 
Um, we are hoping to get time for Q&A, uh, so I invite all of you in the Q&A um, chat line to please um, tell us what you would like to ask our speakers. I will collate those uh, questions and try and ask, ask as many questions as possible at the end. And now, without further ado, uh, Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paolo. Well, first of all, on behalf of John Zeisel and Kirsty Bennett and myself, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Paolo, and Chris Lynch and Glenn Rees for initiating this report, which I believe is the first attempt at a truly international overview of designing for people living with dementia. And I'd also like to thank the people in ADI who provided us with graphics design, proofreading, web design, and administrative help. This report has been a large project with a, a lot of moving parts. One of the basic challenges was to decide on how to structure the report as a whole and the chapters that make it up, to find some sort of common language that would link the parts into a coherent whole. You know, this is a pretty big challenge in a relatively young field like designing for people with dementia. Branches of science typically take many generations to develop taxonomies, sets of laws and other schema that underpin their conversations, their discourse, their explorations. And I'm sure that we've only been partially successful in achieving this in the report, but we've, you know, we've made a start. Um, and, and we made that start by suggesting that where it was appropriate to the topic, authors should try to use a set of design principles as a framework for their thoughts and writing. Now, those of you who are familiar with our work uh, will not be at all surprised to hear that the principles that we suggested were those that Kirsty and I have been associated with for many years. But I, you know, I have to say in our defense that uh, within the report, you'll find that with John Zeisel's help, we've spent quite a lot of time and effort in making sure that this choice was justifiable. I have to say, I think that's a very interesting part of the report. I do recommend it. Now, this is not time to describe these principles in any detail. But if we can go to the next slide, you'll see them uh, sc scrolling through. But it is worth saying that a principle in this context is defined in the Cambridge English Dictionary as a basic truth that explains or controls how something works. I'm wondering if Annie can, can give us the next slide. Is, is that possible? That's good. Thank you, Annie. In this case, these are, these are basic truths that begin the explanation of how to build buildings to support people with dementia. Now you see that there's 10 of them that, uh, that we use. Now happily, the contributors to this report were willing to give this approach a go. And I think the report is all the better for it. Now, those of you who read the report carefully will see many references to these principles. Now this focus on, on the principles extended to the contribution of the 84 case studies. So Annie, if I could have the next slide, please. So we have 84 case studies from 27 countries that make a volume two of the report. These case studies illustrate the extension of the design effort from its starting point in residential care through day care facilities. And now we're seeing them emerging into public buildings. Uh, and there's some very surprising case studies in, in, in volume two uh, about public buildings in various parts of the world that took me entirely by surprise. Volume two also shows how much more work we need to do to get good design into hospitals. It really does seem to be an area which is sadly neglected. I'm deeply grateful to the people who found the time to complete the survey that was the foundation of these case studies and not just to complete the survey, they also had to get together the plans and the photographs that bring the case studies to life. Now they did this during a time of unprecedented challenge to the care of the elderly in the form of, as you know, COVID-19. I'm sure that if, if this report had been written in a normal year, but I do want to emphasize that the people who contributed to their case studies did so a great expense uh, in, a, in a time of enormous stress. The case studies illustrate the diversity of approaches being taken across the world 
and show that innovation and creativity are by no means confined to high income or Western countries. Indeed, the report illustrates the dangers of assuming that what has been learned in high income countries is directly applicable in other contexts. And Ishtar, I'm sure, will have something to say about that in a few minutes' time. And we should be humble in offering advice outside of the context in which the knowledge base was developed. This realization is reflected in the recommendations. Annie, I wonder if we can go on to the next slide, please. The, re the recommendations are general in nature, designed to foster an international conversation that will test the relevance of our current knowledge to cultures outside of those where that knowledge was developed while at the same time highlighting the fact that there's been more than 40 years of development and that there are some things that are pretty certain can be applied so that people with, living with dementia are afforded the dignity that they, as ordinary citizens of this world, have every right to expect. In brief, the recommendations are that ADI facilitates conversations aimed at establishing an internationally accepted set of design principles to guide research and practice in designing for people living with dementia. You know, while this report has used a set of principles, there's no statement here that these are the, you know, the only you know, design principles which are uh, useful. Indeed, this, they are an, uh, an invitation to others to come up with you know, an internationally recognized set of principles that will guide research and conversation and planning. And that, of course, flows on to recommendation two, that all dementia, national dementia plans consider the role of designing for people with dementia in improving services and facilities. While there will no doubt be cultural differences, it is clear that designing well for people with dementia does have real impacts on those people, positive impacts. Recommendation three recognizes that we can learn from other fields of disability we can learn from the advocates in the fields of disability that have found ways to make sure that design features to improve access for those with physical disabilities are included in buildings. Why can't we do the same sort of thing for people with dementia to make buildings more accessible for them? So ADI will be supporting that conversation. The fourth recommendation is that we increase the number of people who have the skills to design for people living with dementia by ensuring that we catch those people you know, in their formative years when they're young and enthusiastic and creative. And we do that by ensuring that they have the option of studying design for dementia in their schools of architecture and design. The fifth recommendation is that we take a close look at the costs and benefits of designing well for people living with dementia, because the evidence suggests that we will find that there are economic benefits to good design, especially design that supports people with dementia living in their own home. And that's a very undeveloped field. The sixth recommendation is that we proactively foster knowledge translation. And don't wait for the new knowledge to find its own way into practice. If we wait for things to find their way from learner journals out of the practice, typically we can spend two decades waiting for that to happen. We have to be much more proactive. And in order to do that, we can use, as recommendation seven suggests, national dementia associations by encouraging them to promote the application of the knowledge that is relevant in their location and culture. And of course, that will need to entail providing them with the resources to do that. And the last, recommendation is a very large recommendation that governments are encouraged to develop mechanisms to engage architects, operators and other key stakeholders in designing for people living with dementia. An example of this is the Australian government's adoption of the principles of design used in this report as the standard, the standard for judging the suitability of the design of aged care facilities used by people living with dementia. But when design for dementia gets at, you know, into that level of what is called in knowledge translation circles adherence, then we know that it is having an impact. So it's my firm belief, my firm expectation, that this report will help us achieve that goal. The designing for people with dementia will simply become business as usual. 
It will no longer be a niche uh, activity. It will just be what always needs to be done. Designing for people with dementia should never be an afterthought. I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much, Richard. I think those are great words to end with. Design for people with dementia should never be an afterthought. Um, before I introduce John, uh, I just would like briefly to mention to you that um, quite a lot of people have said that the chat line are, uh, is being a distraction. Uh, so could I ask uh, please uh, people to stop using the chat line for the next few presentations. I know we are all very keen to hear who you are and you are telling us I have had already probably 50 countries telling me that they are online. Um, please use the Q&A if you have any specific question. Uh, a few people have asked where can they download the report. The report is available freely online at www.alz.co.uk which is Alzheimer's Disease International website. And now, without further ado, I um, cede the floor to John Zeisel, the president and co-founder of Hearthstone. John, please, uh, the floor is yours. Paula, thank you so much for, uh, for the introduction and for this opportunity. Um, I don't usually begin by thanking people, but I do wish to thank you and Chris and Taylor and Annie at the, at the association, but also my, my colleagues, Richard and, and Christy, uh, we've been meeting weekly uh, on this report and on selecting case studies and selecting examples. Um, and so I, I, I don't think this could have been done without the firm teamwork of the group. What I'm going to speak about today is the growth of interest in design for dementia, its roots, its issues, and its future. I would like to say that there's a, another colleague of ours, Jan Golombiewski, who um, wrote on LinkedIn today, design for dementia changes from today. And I would like to uh, say, I believe that's the case. This report represents really 40 years of work, of, of, of awareness, but also the next 40 years um, uh, and the future. Of, of non pharmacologic echo psychosocial interventions. And echo, meaning house in Greek, is the representation of the physical environment as part of our treatment for people with dementia. And I believe today is an important day. Next slide, please. As I said, the, 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 the growth began in the 1970s and 80s. Little did we know then how important an issue this was going to become, dementia was going to become. Um, the, the mini mental state exam, mini mental uh, exams, people had no idea how important that would become. The global deterioration scale by my friend, Barry Reesberg, he developed the, the seven scales of dementia, which have changed and grown over the years. And then there was a book called Environmental Psychology by Harold Pershansky and some colleagues in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, that, that, that I determined the importance of the physical environment as a social impact. Um, and then there was EDRA, the D Design Research Association. So much has occurred since then. We didn't know how important it was going to be. Next slide, please. And during the late 1970s and all the way through the 1990s, and this is a table from the report, there were incredible contributions by ground-breaking operators, developers, architects, who really were, were searching in the, in, the, in the void for what to do. But they invented and they developed projects from France, from Australia, from the US, from Japan, from Sweden, all over uh, in, during those years of people who were exploring how to put little apartments in big buildings for people with dementia or creating home-like environments and creating common spaces and gardens and community scale and family scale buildings. All of these were vital to our knowledge today. Next slide, please. And the approaches that were studied uh, and, and discovered, which were then groundbreaking, but today is common sense, is locating communities locating residences in the communities, the family scale home likeness, um, inviting the public into 
uh, community spaces within settings, such as a bistro or a, a wellness um, building. In, 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 in uh, Sweden, that's the case. In England, that's the case. In Holland, there are many examples. Uh, the importance of engagement within all common spaces all day long, that engagement can replace reactive behaviors. And redundant queuing, understanding that people read the environment differently, as well as providing choices through design and having legibility and natural mapping. All of these, and, and a, a staff that's stable to the residents, all of these issues were discovered and explored in these early groundbreaking um, uh, projects, which I've described in the, in the chapter, which we describe in our chapter. Next slide, please. And the future lies not only in new projects that are coming out, and our chapter on uh, groundbreaking design includes several of the important projects that we see pointing towards the future, but also the, in, the, in the knowledge that has been developed by pioneers, innovative architects, and what we call paradigm shifters, including Wilhelmina Hoffman, who is speaking today. On that note, what I would like to do is, is is shift to the trailer for all of these interviews by these living groundbreakers, which are fantastic, is a fantastic inter, inter, intervention and, and introduction to not only the past and the present, but to the future. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide and watch the, in the, show, the, um, the trailer. When the doors were locked within six or eight hours, the agitation and distress level of the building just started skyrocketing. They'd go to a door and they'd push on it and it would be locked. And then they'd look around and they'd go to another door and it would be locked. And then they'd go to some other residents and they'd say, you know, they've locked the door. Whatever you design, you must design for the improving health and reducing the stress of people. And you design for our emotion and experiences. You can't just have the materiality. You have to have the, the space in the right shape and size and position to allow those feelings of comfort to take place. That's so many generations ago that we grew up in forests and nature and we have that somewhere buried beneath us that we have a real need to relate to nature and people with dementia no different from anyone else. Um, so when we design for dignity, you're designing for the unique challenges that each individual uh, might uh, both deserves and needs. And of course, um, no two individuals are alike in the way in which they age. And designing for people with dementia isn't about designing a nice building that's going to get in the magazines because it's a great piece of architecture. It's a much more humble um, occupation than that. It's recreating familiarity. I mean. So I think the next step should be that we, as a society, we embrace people with dementia so they can really stay in their own homes, uh, assisted uh, by um, informal carers, but also with uh, technology. If you see the status of AI with all the sensors, how they monitor how you can live in your own house and how they can warn you if things are not going all right. What works for people with cognitive problem will work for many, many, many more. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all my wonderful and informative colleagues who participated in these interviews. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. And thank you for reminding uh, to us uh, some important elements of the report, which I draw everybody's attention. So on the report really tries and delve into the issue of community, how these spaces can be uh, shared in a community fashion. This is not about putting people in an isolated place. This is about integration in the community. And in these days of COVID-19, and after all of the webinars we run this winter, that will resonate with so many of you. And now, uh, Kirsty, um, who is with the University of Wollongong, uh, a senior academic, but a, a wonderful person that has been studying these issues in the community for many, many years, 
it is a pleasure to give the floor to you. Kerstin, you, you may need to unmute. Yeah. Yes, I'm right. Thank you. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you today about cultural aspects of designing for people living with dementia. And when I think about that, I start with the principles. We've heard about some key design principles when Richard spoke. And the design principles are presented in our report as one of four domains. They're one part, but a very important part of designing for people living with dementia. Principles guide us as we respond to overarching goals, such as human rights. They guide us as we consider design approaches and responses. They point us in the direction of things that are important to design well for people living with dementia. Things such as creating a familiar place, providing opportunities to be alone or with others. And design principles have a key role to play in responding to culture. It's vital that we don't start with solutions and so build settings that may be meaningless in a particular cultural context. Understanding and responding to each cultural context is vital. It starts with briefing. That is listening, seeking to understand what's important to the people in this place and what do they want to do? We need to recognise the importance of briefing if we are to design well in different cultural contexts. We need to allocate time to undertake it, to consult, to figure out who it is we actually need to be talking to, to listen, to try to understand what we're being told, and to respond and then keep listening and responding and listening throughout the project. With a good brief, we can apply the principles well and create a great design. Culture should shape a project brief. The next slide, please, Annie. And culture will also drive scope. It needs to drive the scope of a project. In this example on the APY lands in the centre of Australia, outdoor areas were really important. But how were they to be designed? At APY, we were told that we were to provide the opportunity for the local Anganu people to create the outdoor spaces they wanted to. Our design task wasn't to finish, it was simply to start and to make sure that what we did made it possible for them to continue. Briefing and scoping are important if we are to design well in a particular cultural context. They provide vital information that shapes the project and informs us about how design principles can best be applied. In this example, which is discussed in the report, we can see the principles in the way the design responds to a vision for way of life, where Amunu can sit outside and be on country. In the way a place is created that is familiar for the people who live there and provides opportunities to be alone or with others. When we look at the next slide, we see two different images. Perhaps these places look more familiar to you. Is this the garden you would seek out? Is this what you think of as an outdoor place? Is this the seat and a view that you would recognise? While the images are different, we can see the same principles in action. Here too, the design responds to a vision for a way of life. It creates a familiar place for the people who live there and provides people with the opportunity to be on their own or with others. Principles can be applied in very different cultural contexts. The key is to take the time to listen to the people we are designing for so we can apply them well. We need to consider the relevance of our knowledge in designing for people living with dementia in particular contexts. And we need to advocate for relevant knowledge to be implemented by planners, designers, architects, care operators, and developers. 
Which brings me to my final slide. We need to give priority to training and education when we design for people living with dementia. The report presents some well-developed approaches in a range of countries and in a variety of settings. It's really positive to have these, but we recognise that these examples occur in particular cultural and economic contexts. We need to keep this in mind and not just replicate them, but learn from them and reinterpret them in our own contexts. We need to consider how knowledge, often gained in high income countries, can support and service development in low and middle income countries in a culturally appropriate way. Education and training is an essential part of knowledge translation. That is, putting what we know into practice. We know a lot. Doing what we know is the challenge but this is how we will achieve change. We need to include education in the curricula of schools of architecture and design so that designers have the knowledge they need. We need to provide resources that respond to cultural context. And the Indigenous Aged Care Design Guide, which is described in the report, is one example. We know that well-designed environments can make a difference to the lives of people living with dementia. If we design in response to culture and context, if we listen and apply the design principles afresh in each setting, we can design well for people living with dementia in many different places. Kerstie, thank you so much for this amazing intervention. It's, uh, it's a joy to hear you speak, I have to say. Um, I also want to thank you in particular for highlighting us uh, the points regarding the design principle that you three co-authors follow throughout the whole report and that inform all of the uh, report uh, philosophy, but also to draw the, our attention to the need for education. In part, we have published this report at ADI because we want to make sure that designing for dementia is going to now be included in the curriculum of any university uh, on the globe. This is what we're going to uh, work and fight for uh, from today onwards. Now, um, I have been told um, by our producing team, which is just the ADI team, but there we are, uh, that we are ready to run our poll. So uh, if we can bear with us a second, Annie will now run the poll. So please let us know who you are that is attending. Are you a person living with dementia, a carer, a policymaker, a planner, an architect or a designer, an Alzheimer's association, academic researcher or student? care manager, medical professional or other. Please vote now. Let us have an idea of our audience and who it is that we have online today. Um, I hope this has given you enough time uh, to get together and vote. And Annie, when you're ready, yes, thank you very much. This is the poll results today. So we have uh, quite a lot of academic researchers uh, but there is a very good spread of everybody else. So thank you very much. I hope somebody in the team is taking a picture of our spread for today so that we can uh, think about how to engage audiences um, going forward. Now, without further ado, because we're a little bit late, so I'd like to remind our speakers that they have to stick strictly to their time and possibly do it even a bit faster. I'm going to hand over to our next speaker, who is Kate Woffer, the Chair, CEO and Co-Founder of Dementia Alliance International and a board member of ADI. Kate, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Paula. And thank you, Paula and uh, ADI for launching such a critical report. And congratulations to the report co-leads, uh, Richard, John and Kirsty, for your very impressive work. Uh, it is comprehensive and I'm sure it'll become an influential report into the future. Thanks also to Richard for the opportunity to contribute to it. Next slide, please, Annie. So the World Health Organization clearly states that dementia is one of the major causes of disability and dependency among older people worldwide. And through campaigning at the WHO Mental Health Forum in Geneva in 2016, cognitive disabilities were added as a fourth category under the mental health umbrella. 
So now that dementia is being described in UN documents as a cognitive disability, we are all reminded that people with dementia are fully recognised by the UN as rights bearers under the CRPD treaty. In an article which I co-authored uh, with Richard and Dr Linda Steele and others, we quoted Susan Cahill who noted that the CRPD allows for a new and exciting dialogue to emerge where the framing of dementia is no longer characterised by stigma, fear and exclusion, but where the individual with dementia is viewed as a legitimate part of mainstream society. And that I think is critical to why this report is so important. Once we accept that dementia is a major cause of disability, um, <clears throat> we come to understand why it's so important that the built environment for people with dementia is accessible in the same way that we provide wheelchair access to people who are in wheelchairs. And with the rise of a disability rights movement for disabilities caused by any type of dementia, predominantly, which has been, <clears throat> pardon me, led by people with dementia globally, we have come to understand the problem is not with the person, but it's often about the environment being made more accessible. And this, of course, includes the physical and built environments. So dis disability arises out of the interaction between a person with a health condition and the environment in which they live and work. Um, so a health condition causing disability from a stroke um, is no different to a long-term uh, health condition such as dementia or such as losing a limb or some other physical loss of function due to an accident. As this slide shows, we've got icon, icons that equate to action included in most countries and in fact legislated for most of the more visible disabilities. So it is now time for the invisible disabilities for people with things such as communication or sensory disabilities to be also included in building design and in the way that organisations operate. What use would a wheelchair be to me if there were no ramp or lift to allow me access with it? Similarly, what use is it for me to go to the bank or a supermarket if the staff can't communicate with me? So not to provide equitable access, including through the built environment for everyone, is like asking someone without legs to climb a flight of stairs. Next slide, please, Annie. So even though people with dementia still retain the same rights as everyone else in society, um, including human rights and disability rights, there has been little change in the realisation of our rights. A human rights based approach is about making people more aware of their rights. And importantly, whilst increasing the accountability of individuals and institutions who are responsible for respecting, protecting and fulfilling our rights, the WHO Global Dementia Action Plan um, uh, identifies human rights and specifically the CRPD is, as one of three cross-cutting principles. The principles included in the CRPD are clear. It is up to us to provide people with any kind of disabilities, including from dementia, with the options to make those choices. We cannot live with dignity if we are not provided with access to live with dignity. We cannot participate equally in society if we're not provided with equal access to do so. So all of these principles are underpinned by the built environment and our responsibility as a society to ensure access to it, as we do with other disabilities. The use of these principles allows a design to respond in different ways to people's needs, to their preferences, lifestyles, cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds as well as to the local climate and geography. But no longer can we pick and choose what rights we wish to uphold or only focus on, for example, only focusing on the right to health, um, which when interpreted do not disrupt the current medicalised approach to dementia. Disability rights and disability access matters to me. In fact, I cannot maintain my independence or current life without that. I hope that also matters to you. People with physical disabilities have made major progress as, as substantial 
influential members of society, yet we are still being left behind, not only in terms of health and social care, but in terms of recognition and the management of dementia as a condition causing disability. And therefore, we're missing out on legislated disability support, support including enabling and accessible built environments and communities. What that means is that people with cognitive disabilities caused by dementia are actually still being denied the most basic access to live independently in their community. And I'm very hopeful that this report is the stepping stone to change that. Thanks, Annie. Thank you very much, Kate, for another thought-provoking presentation. Um, we... The environmental influence in creating disability is well established. Um, uh, as the image of this wheelchair shows us, even wheelchairs are being made much more accessible than they were first when first in use. This is how we must view the built environment too, as we all need equitable access we know that most people who have dementia or who, or who are older and require assistance with our daily lives would prefer to con continue to live in their own communities and their own homes and society has a responsibility to ensure that equal access. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. I, um, I'm always amazed by uh, the need for action which you are highlighting throughout, uh, and you have highlighted to me since I started at uh, Alzheimer's Disease International, uh, we, we need to do things here. Um, you know, we, we are, I'm delighted to see so many um, people in the field uh, at the webinar today. I hope that you'll all bring it in your heart that we need action. We need to implement all these wonderful things that the report says. Um, and Kate has been working on human rights for ages. And still, yet, we see that uh, uh, things are not happening. Kate uh, came back from the UN last year telling me, well, isn't it interesting that in the end at the disability gathering there was no access for people with disability. Um, now, I'm paraphrasing here, but I think he says all. So Kate, uh, thank you so much also for continuing to keep an eye for all of us on what's happening in the CPRD. Without your work, we wouldn't be aware of what's going on really in this field. Thank you. I now give the floor to Kevin Charra, uh, who is at the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Rennes and uh, who uh, is going to talk to us from of human rights as well from a different perspective. Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my paper on this very important day and to introduce my work about human rights design and dementia. Can we pass the slide, please? So when addressing human rights design and dementia, grounds for such an approach basically turn around two major dimensions. First one is fighting against injustice, such as discriminations, stigmatization, and self-depreciation. Self-depreciation also reminds us that it's about promoting competencies through democracy, global citizenship, and of course, capabilities. And as we can understand with these two points, is that such an approach cannot only rely on design principles, because design has little meaning outside a value system. Next slide, please. And within this, the actual value system, as Laura Steele and collaborators uh, point out, there is a common belief that people with dementia should live in contained and specific environment and under continuous surveillance. That's what we observe on the field. And such a state of mind results in stigmatization and self-depreciation, as I said just before which can turn out to be very disabling for people with dementia because it activates malignant behavioral schemes. And most of all, we can also observe a form of segregation, which sets the ground for implementing an inclusive approach. Next slide, please. What you can see is in this, is in this slide is that, um, it's, and it's quite appalling, is when, when design relies on stigma and stereotypes of dementia. 
It turns into furniture that is vintage, colors and contrasts that are exaggerated, and, we find, and, and signage that is triple in size as, as if people with dementia would better understand big signage more than small signage. And we find streets inside buildings too, which can be very, very confusing. Next slide. Whereas uh, there is a tremendous amount of work that has been done on design principles for people with dementia, for which the coordinators of this report, among others, have greatly contributed to as pioneer, pioneers in this, in this field. The design characteristics they expose in their models are all marked with humanism, respect, dignity, and identity. And these models aim at healing or compensating by serving equality or equity, which, much, which must be kept in mind when designing for people with dementia. But if we look as it is today, societal and social values have moved, have moved on and call to move a step further also in ways of design. Next, next slide, thank you. And this is to challenge architects, designers, and most of all, dementia caregivers, is that is to embrace an inclusive approach, an inclusive approach of based on uh, empowerment and promoting capabilities by actually removing barriers and creating supportive environments in order for people to cope with the environment, with their own abilities, no matter how much cognitive alterations they are facing. And this means actually relying on design principles that focus on legibility of space, as well as affordances of individuals in order to address opportunities uh, for basic human rights principles to be implemented and activate adaptive behavioral schemes. On the contrary, as malignant uh, behavioral schemes. So inclusive design is on its way and has to be implemented as well for architectural, but also urbanistic and landscape design and which we don't always um, consider when we, we're talking about design, architectural de design. Next slide, please. So there we are. It's, all this is to enable people with dementia to have the opportunity to maintain independence, to connect with the community, to encounter diversity and address social health issues in order, in order to be able to age in place, whether at home, or in institutions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Kevin, um, for something that has really helped us frame uh, the whole discussion around human rights and uh, both in time and um, in synchronous uh, right now, contemporarily. I uh, now am delighted to uh, pass the floor to Guillermina Hoffman, who is the principal and CEO of Sylvia Hammett and who uh, has a wonderful story to tell. Can I also draw your attention around the video that Guillermina uh, filmed for us for the report. This time the report um, is online and we have been able to add a lot of content that otherwise it would have not been possible. So Guillermina, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. You may need to unmute yourself. Am I, are you hearing me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Paola. And I would say hello to all friends around the world today. Um, I am going to speak about uh, a project called Sylvia Bo, and the foundation Stiftes and Sylvia Emmet was initiated and founded by Her Majesty Queen Sylvia of Sweden, and she has been the active chair of the board since 25 years now. The foundation works for quality of life for persons with dementia by several education programs, for example, academic education for health and social care workers, leading to titles like Sylvia Nurse, Sylvia Doctors, etc., and by certification programs for whole care units. Next slide, please. Well, five years ago, Mr. Kamprad, founder of IKEA, came to visit Sylvia Emmet for afternoon tea with the Queen and I was happy to join them. 
Mr. Kamprad admired the Queen's work for people with dementia and asked what she would like to do next. And the Queen said she would like people with dementia to be able to stay longer at home with their loved ones in a better built apartment, affordable, nice looking and smart. Mr. Kamprad then said, let's do it. And he donated privately a sum of money for this project. Next slide, please. Sylvia Bo is the name of the project and it has been ongoing now since then, since five years. And it is a cooperation with a building company with the name Bo Klok, developed by Skanska, a huge building company and IKEA, and IKEA Interior Design, sharing know-how between the disciplines, dementia know-how, house building and interior design. Two pilot houses with three apartments in each were built after many hours of meetings, of discussions and work about what would work for people with cognitive problems, also taking into account closeness to social activities. The persons in the nearby Silvia Medeca Center were also involved in the process and provided us with their views all the way from the entrance, in every room and space, as well as the garden. In each house, one local was made to showcase a home with smart solutions and innovation, innovations for inspiration for all our students and study visits. And on this picture, you can see the entrance of one of the houses with the red frame around the door and on the other house the frame was yellow. Next slide please. Three years ago the houses were ready and here you can see Her Majesty and His Majesty showing the kitchen. You can for example see glass doors so you easily can see where the plates and glasses are. There's light in the drawers contrast color of handles and blinds to avoid reflections from the windows. Here are also stable tables and chairs. There is a mix of built-in solutions in the houses and shows an interior design for independence and safety. Next slide please. And here you can see some example from first from the bedroom which has a door to the bathroom and there's also a, a, a door to the bathroom from the hall entrance because even if it's a small apartment it's always the toilet or the bathroom you need to find very fast. In the bathroom there is slippery free and warm floor and the use of contrast colors to find the way to the toilet etc. And the walls insides are prepared if you need support handles so it, it must be easy to just put them up. And you can also see here the stove with color marks and contrast colors on door handles and around the light switches. Sylvia Bow project, sadly the neighbors complained so the pilot apartments are not yet in use but we are not giving up. We have already again applied for the houses and we are waiting now for the results. We hope that in the near future to be able to get access to our pilot houses and learn more from the persons who will live there for further development. But the Sylvia Boo project is ongoing as well as our cooperation for good housing with Booklook and IKEA. And today there is more than 100 solutions added from a normal apartment and built into the Sylvia Boo apartments. And we have seen that when it works for persons with cognitive problems, it also works for many more. And aware of this demographic situation all around the world, I think building like this should be the new normal, really. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Wilhelmina. And thank you for giving us so many visual examples of the great things you've been doing with the Sylvia Boo project, for which we wish you good luck. Um, it's also the time to remind everybody that Queen Sylvia very kindly is one of the ambassadors of ADI and we are very honored uh, to have a, a royal who is actually so uh, personally involved uh, in all elements of the foundation is quite extraordinary um, and an example of how uh, this can help, although it can't help with planning permission. 
So everybody needs to keep uh, at it and try to insist for things to happen. Now we are running a little bit out of time, so I'm going to pass the floor directly to uh, Dr. Ishtar Govia, who is one of the leads of the uh, Stride project, which is one of ADI's projects uh, with the, uh, the London School of Economics. Uh, in Jamaica, and um, uh, it's, she's at the University of West Indies, and a great supporter of all the work that we do at ADI. Ishtar, it's a pleasure to give the floor to you to tell us more about design uh, in uh, lower and middle income countries. Thank you. Thank you, Paola, and thank you all of the colleagues on the panel and all of the audience members. I'm happy today to speak with you on behalf of STRIDE, which is Strengthening Responses to Dementia, in developing countries and this is a very unique partnership between academic institutions and particularly with Alzheimer's Disease International because we realize that research does not get through to policymakers unless there is an R, a call to arms, a call to action. And so we in stride are seven developing countries. Next slide please. As you know in 10 years time there are going to be over 75 million people all around the world living with dementia and the vast majority of these people are going to be living in lower and middle income countries we know that in this period of time as well the number of older persons in our societies is going to increase vastly for example by 71 percent in latin america and the caribbean and by 47% in Oceania. So STRIDE was meant to take place and is taking place in seven um, countries all around the world with a diversity of languages, a diversity of ethnicities, a diversity of geographies, and that have a large proportion of their population moving into an aging demographic. Next slide, please. We know that in these settings, even in the context where there's a lot of conversation about deinstitutionalization of healthcare, we already are having a large number of families um, holding the care responsibilities. A large number of people in these countries, the vast majority of persons are living in their homes. These are being supported by unpaid carers. And so it's very important to keep in mind that in lower and middle income countries, most care homes are actually privately operated and they're extremely costly. So the average person in a lower and middle income country does not belong to a high income group and cannot afford these facilities. So there is also in terms of community settings and thinking about community-based care, there is unfortunately a lack of awareness and a lack of systems in place that safeguard persons living with dementia. And so they're exposed to a lot of dangers, particularly because of the stigma that exists. And the stigma has been further exacerbated by COVID-19 we know we're hearing a lot of conversation about keeping older persons safe and keeping older persons who are members of vulnerable communities safe as well. But as Kate was pointing out in her comments, we really need to avoid thinking about uh, marshalling all of our older persons into some facility where they're not really interacting with other persons and they're being isolated. So next slide, please. In this context where dementia is not necessarily a national priority and we have a majority of older persons and persons with dementia living in their homes, we really need to keep in mind what is consistently the most important thing. In these contexts, it's that safety is first and foremost considered and that this family responsibility and community responsibility often is borne by, for example, neighbors, by places of worship, by community organizations, and these entities help to ensure that safety is maintained. And this is actually the key consideration for designing for dementia. We know that in a vast number of our lower and middle income countries, there's also a move towards urbanization and this move towards urbanization and move towards people living in crowded spaces has major implications as well in terms of how they interact with services and resources there. 
What we've seen from the diversity of countries from the STRIDE project is that cultural adaptation is a must and that the design principles need to be very much adapted and they have to be flexible because there are some settings that are not conducive to using all of them. Next slide, please. However, we are finding some very creative ways of, hap of engaging with um, resources. We see people in different communities engaging their carpenters, their neighbors, as we see in the first image here from Indonesia. And we're also seeing a lot of advocacy by our organizations because dementia is increasingly understood as a long-term care issue. And it really needs to be incorporated in all policies. And this is where, again, this report and this call to action and having this mobilization is really important because we see that these assumptions of what design is and what design looks like and who design is for and where design takes place, it's sometimes not translatable to where the vast majority of persons in low and middle income countries who, again, are going to be the vast majority of cases of persons living with dementia, it's not translatable into those contexts. Next slide, please. And I want to say a special, special thanks to all of these wonderful people who co-authored this chapter as, um, ad, as um, Paola and Laura and everyone has indicated, Chris has indicated before these types of advocacy efforts are not the work of a single person. We need all hands on deck. We need all voices speaking very loudly. And these beautiful people in this image here that you see have been speaking very loudly in their country context. And it has been an honor to work with them as the knowledge exchange and impact leads of the STRIDE project. Thank you. Ishtar, thank you so much. And thanks for reminding us of the wonderful people behind STRIDE, uh, that you have quite a few on your slide. There is even more behind the scene. You're doing an amazing job. And also to remind us of the complexity um, I think I was first, I first realized that this report was doable when I was in uh, Bangalore with Mira Patabiraman, who is one of the contributors, and I saw one of the houses adapted there, and I realized this can be done really cost effectively. It doesn't cost the health, it can be done everywhere in the world. We just have to tell people that this is possible. Um, so there is a lot that we can do together. And, uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll get there eventually with good advocacy and with a lot of energy as we normally have. So thank you so much. And now it's my pleasure to pass the floor to Dr. Alison Dawson, who is a senior research fellow with the School of Social Sciences at the University of Sterling and other leading light in this particular area. Alison, the floor is yours for the last intervention of the day. Then we are getting a lot of Q&A, so I hope to have sufficient time to take a few uh, questions. Thank you. I'll, I'll go as quickly as I can, Paola. Uh, Annie, can I have the next slide? Um, firstly, because I know that we're going to run out of time, I want to say my thanks first to Chris and all colleagues at Alma, Alzheimer's Disease International, to Richard, John and Kirsty. Uh, to Whitney, Francis, Leslie and Martin, who uh, are my uh, co-authors on the chapter that's in the report. Um, and just to say that um, I've shown you that picture particularly because actually I haven't grown anything in my garden for years until this year. Um, and it suddenly became clear to me that uh, in an environment which I was finding very confusing, very difficult and lacking in control. There was something that I could do that would connect me with the green space, which uh, our other presenters have said is so important, um, which did produce a tangible product and which in the great scheme of things may not have seemed very much, but made a big difference to me uh, and to, to, to my close relatives. So, Next slide, please. The lessons I think that we can draw from COVID so far, and there are many more to come, I'm sure. The first for me is that we're all vulnerable. Um, there's hardly a country in the world that hasn't been touched by uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and when we look at the pandemic, those countries which have been the most affected in terms of numbers of cases have often been the most affected in terms of the number of deaths in care homes.
but there are differences between countries and we do have to come together to work out why those are. Um, the next lesson that I would draw is that actually we're learning. Um, we know a little bit more about uh, the virus itself, a little bit about, more about its makeups, but actually we still know very little, uh, particularly in relation to design. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, one of the absolutely fundamental lessons, as far as I'm concerned, is that if we'd forgotten, uh, if we hadn't realised, uh, we're now being reminded that social and physical interaction are so important. Actually, they're important for everybody in all of our societies, but they're particularly important for people who are living with cognitive impairment and dementia. Um, and I think the final of my lessons is that frontline workers are critical. In different countries uh, around the world, as in the UK, um, there were periodic claps for carers. Often they were for the healthcare workers. Um, our frontline long-term care workers, uh, our informal carers, uh, the people who do the bins, who keep the water and electricity, really everybody there is important. And we have to think about how the things that we might be suggesting in terms of design impact not just on people who are living in long-term care, for example, but also uh, on staff and on the staff's ability to do work. So can I have the next slide, please? In terms of the impacts of COVID-19 on dementia design, uh, in a relatively small uh, space for a presentation, I can only pick out a few. For me, one of the impacts is the danger that we might start to privilege design again to meet clinical or medical needs as opposed to meeting people's spiritual or social needs and I think that's a really concerning item. There is a big question around whether in light of COVID-19 and how that poses different risks, more serious risks to some of the uh, viral infections for example that uh, long-term care environments have been used to and guarding against for decades now. There is a question about whether dementia design can be fit for purpose in the context of COVID-19. But I'd, rather than have everything uh, appearing to be down, I think one of the impacts around dementia design has been that uh, COVID-19 has encouraged invention and innovation and it will continue to do so. Can I have the next slide, please? Finally, what I want to leave you with uh, is a call to action. I think that we have to reach across academia and practice and lived experience. Uh, we have to revisit the dementia design principles uh, and Kirsty has helpfully talked to us about goals, principles, approaches and responses. Sometimes it's not possible, as Ishtar said, uh, to put all of the principles into practice but what we do have to do is keep striving to try our best to get all of the goals of dementia design incorporated into the solutions that we come up with. I think we have to recognize the rights of people living with dementia, uh, people who are working in long-term care, we have to recognize uh, their rights to fulfilling lives to a lived experience that's the best it can be, to a working experience that's the best it can be, given that there are risks and that we have to manage the risks of COVID-19 transmission and infection and we have to control those. But we also have to appreciate that there are significant risks in relation to people's psychological health uh, and their cognitive and physical abilities if we take actions which essentially starve people of the stimulation and support that they need in order to maintain abilities to live their best possible lives. Uh, and finally, and I think that this is a message that's coming through from all of the other presenters, we need to design or redesign for context. And that includes uh, the context of COVID-19, but also uh, the rights context, also the uh, economic context for low and middle income countries. And we need to see all of those contexts 
as setting the backdrop um, for our design innovations. Um, and if I can leave you with that and one last plea to read the report as much as you can. Thank you. Alison, thank you very much for this great presentation and for bringing us uh, up to date in the uh, COVID era. We all felt it was very important given that design had played such a part, we feel, uh, in what happened and what ADI has been decrying as the uh, great problem with long-term care and care homes during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we should highlight those points and I think um, Alison has, has captured so well the, the complex balance that we need to strike. Uh, and given that we are all looking at second spikes, we hope these lessons will be of help in the months going forward. Now, let's pass to the Q&A because we got a lot of questions. Now, uh, the first question I would like uh, to address uh, to the principal uh, writer of the report, to Richard. Um, this is a big question, but Richard, I'd love to ask you to reply it in, in, a, in a short space of time, if possible. Um, Anna Moore I had asked whether we have to date any useful models of good design in the acute care sector and how do we implement such models? You could speak for an hour about that, but can I ask you to be brief? So this is for Richard, please. You will have to unmute yourself. I am sorry for that. I, I vowed I would not make that mistake. Um, yeah, we have some, we have very few good examples of of design in, in the acute care sector, certainly that I'm aware of, and that came through in the in the case studies where we only had one uh, one submission of, of, a, of a a place that. Uh, that has put it into operation a systematic approach to designing for people with dementia. In contrast, we had 50 or 60 from residential care. And I think that that, that sort of ratio tells us a little bit about you know, where our attention has lain over the last 20 or 30 years. I'm sure that at the present time there are more, uh, there is more interest in designing in the acute care setting. I know Kirsty, for example, is very involved in that. I know that Tom Gray in, in Ireland is, is very in, in involved in that. But as yet, uh, there are very few examples that we can point to. Uh, sorry, I'm unmuting myself now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard. Can I now ask, this is a difficult question to answer, uh, but can I also suggest to everybody to read the report because there's plenty of example in the 250 pages case studies around this. Um, can I ask now, please, John, to answer another question, which is, how um, can care homes currently make modifications to their premises in line with the new recommendations? Once again, the report kind of answers that, but John, could I ask you to give a few uh, pointers to this question? Thank you. I think the um, principles that we spoke about have to do with home likeness, have to do with safety. There's a, there's a bunch of them, and, and, and by the way, Kevin Charas, in his work uh, deals a lot with modifications to care homes. So the first thing would be to, to create a safety net such that residents can be more independent um, because it's safe and they, they can't get in trouble um, in, in, in places that are, are, are difficult for them so that the staff can be their friend and be their supporter rather than trying to stop them all the time from doing something that's unsafe. The second is to focus on home likeliness, homeness, homeliness and familiarity as, um, as Peter Fippen and as the principals uh, describe. Um, the other is to really make the outside, is to work on the gardens and any access to outside, both making them safe but also familiar and comfortable um, to people. So uh, the, the principles can be implemented. Uh, it might also mean taking a hard look at the number of bedrooms versus common spaces. So all of those are, are not only small fixes, but they are also uh, large judgments that have to be made. We are involved in, in several uh, renovations of care homes and of, of, of long-term care into more dementia friendly environments and these are the kind of concerns that come up. 
Um, thank you very much. You, you kind of achieved the impossible to answer the really complicated question so quickly. Um, can I thank pass you. to Kersi, please? Kersi, can you answer the question whether you can give an example of culturally appropriate design? Thank you. Ah, well, culturally appropriate design, yes, I, I showed one example that's certainly covered in the report on the APY lands. Um, I think culturally appropriate design is when people can do what they want to do and live the life they want to live without judgment and without being forced to live in an environment or obliged to live in an environment that isn't meaningful to them. So. So as far as giving you an example, the, the example that's in the report, I think the APY lands is, is the one that's straightforward. Rather, I think it's, it's important to focus on that general approach and we hopefully can see those in many places where designs have responded to what people really need and what they, what's important to them. And that goes back to briefing and talking to people to find out what matters and responding to that rather than starting by saying, here you are, have one of these. We need to go back and talk to people and then respond in a way that's meaningful to them. And then it will be culturally appropriate. Thank you very much, Kirsty. We are running out of time, but I'd like to take a few more questions. I can see quite a lot of people are still online. In fact, the vast majority, thank you so much to you all to keep online. Now, there's been quite a lot of questions for Wilhelmina. People are really interested in understanding why is that the neighbors oppose the planning permission and whether there are issues of stigma surrounding that. Wilhelmina, would you be so kind as to reply to that question? Yeah, yes, of course. And, and we are really sad about this. And we, we think it's, it could be about the stigma and that is very, very, very sad. But uh, like I said before, we do not give up. We cannot give up because we think this must be must be done to we need to showcase that it is possible to build homes for people where they can stay a little bit longer but connected in a social environment so they can be self and be safe and it's independent so we are we are waiting for a new result and i hope to be able to invite you to, to visit those homes, but still the, the production of the Sylvia Bo apartment is going on, but not like the pilot project, but it's the Bo Clo company um, working with this. But I will come back with the result. I hope it's a positive result soon. Thank you so much, Wilhelmina. I hope this is uh, satisfying the curiosity of our listeners. I have an important question here that I'd like to ask Richard to Richard first, but please, any of the panelists, if they want to jump into this one, uh, this is from Marina Cutler, who asks, does anyone incorporate or have you taken into account the impact of visual stimulation, such as color and art, within the designing principles, and the impact of artistic stimulation being part of daily activities, especially during COVID-19? This is a big question. Uh, Richard, would you start it, and then anyone else that wants to jump in, please do. Yes, the, uh, the, the, uh, the use of visual stimulation, particularly uh, art and, uh, and other attractive stimuli, is, is uh, covered in the principles. Um, and of course, it's, it's very widely practiced these days. I mean, you, it's, I think it's now taken for granted that uh, when we choose an environment for people with dementia, it should include stimulation which stimulates people's spiritual responses if you like and their creative responses and as, as, as well as simply giving them visual cues for for wayfinding and it is included it's covered in the principles of optimizing helpful stimulation it's also covered in, in terms of uh, providing opportunities for for engagement as well as being covered in in the overarching uh, principle of, of providing a vision for a way of life Thank you. Would any other of the panelists like to, to come into this one? Otherwise, I'll pass to the next one. Well, just briefly, um, there are, the, the, Richard mentioned the engagement aspect of art, and there are specific kinds of methods um, that we use to develop treatment photographs. We call them treatment photos um, around using um, survey methods with people with dementia to show them different art 
and see how engaged they get and see um, what is meaningful to them. And so it, the, the, the visual stimulation is more than that. It really is an engagement process. Thank you very much for this clarification. I hope we have addressed this question once again. It's important to read the report because there's a lot in the report around art and color. Uh, I'd like now to pass to a question for Kevin Sharraz. Um, Kevin, man you mentioned in the presentation that somebody had a street in the building. The person is asking, he said that they were a bit confused by the statement. He has seen the street in the building in many care homes. What should the care homes do instead? Kevin, unmute yourself and- Yes, uh, I, have, thank you. I have. Thank you for this question. I think it's, it's, uh, it was a very, it's important to address this question also because uh, we've seen it in a lot of care homes. The thing is, if we're talking to people that are easily confused, we also have to think about, and I think all the, all the people that have spe spoken in, in, this, uh, in this webinar have mentioned that. It's not about uh, having extraordinary design or anything. It's about doing design that people will understand. And my question is, how do you understand a street inside a building? Is that normal? Is this something that you actually um, often meet or not when you live at home? Personally, when I get out of my room, when I get out of my, of my sitting room, if I live in, a, in an apartment, I won't get into the street, I'll get into a corridor. Um, if I live into a, in a house, yeah, but not, not if I get out from my room. So it's about this type of, of, um, of, um, of, of thoughts you have to, this type of reflection you have to, to ask yourself is, is it normal, would I find this? And if I do not find it in normal life, and I think we, we, a lot of people said it, is what is good for others is also good for us. And what is good for people with dementia is good for everyone. And I think that's, it's, it's how we have to answer this question is, personally, I didn't get out from my room and I see, uh, I see a street or a fake street or whatever. And I think that people, and I, John Zaiso often talks about hardwired um, uh, uh, architecture, uh, hardwired, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of the home. Uh, it's about how we represent ourselves home and how it will enable us to cope with the environment in which we are in, uh, which we are in. Sorry, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. That, that explains a lot, but I know that Kate probably will want to come into this question too. Kate, um, you have made a lot of points around this issue of what is normal. Um, um, sorry, so late at night, I'm, I'm, uh, you need to repeat the question. So the question was about the street in the building. So a person was asking uh, Kevin, uh, what does it mean if, uh, why street in the building in a care home is not appropriate? Kevin's point was things that are not normal would confuse people. Normally in a building, you wouldn't have a street. Um, would you like to make a comment on that one in particular on why people shouldn't have things in buildings that don't look like life? Because uh, I think they're not life. It's, just, it's like trying to make a fake world for real people. It it's, uh, lacks dignity and respect from our perspective. Thank you very much, Kate. I think that says it all because it's not life. That's why it, it's a good idea. Um, and uh, there is another question here that uh, is uh, asking whether people with dementia uh, did participate in the report. Kate, perhaps you want to explain what's your background so that people understand not only your background, but also the fact that you represent the uh, Dementia Alliance International. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Paula. So, um, so I, for those who don't know, I live with young onset dementia. Um, the surveys that Professor Fleming um, uh, put out went out through through our whole um, membership and beyond that uh, and I'm pretty sure quite a lot of the case studies have involved people with dementia. So I, I couldn't say how many, Richard might know that. Thank you very much Kate. Um, quite a few people contributed to the report who have dementia um, but I, I'm going to move quickly to uh, the lower and middle income country question 
there is a question for Ishtar. Uh, what is the role of caregivers culturally in Jamaica? Uh, Ishtar, this is a big question. Uh, perhaps you can reply to that uh, succinctly. Sure, it is a big question. So the vast majority of our carers are unpaid carers, they're family carers, um, and they play a massive role culturally. So the family members, as well as the places of worship and the people within the communities play a massive role in terms of helping to keep the person who's living with dementia safe if they're moving from outside the home, helping to provide things like medication, contributing to financing, contributing to assistance with day-to-day -day activities as well. But we do know that we need a lot of advocacy. This situation is not um, unique to Jamaica. As a matter of fact, it's across all of the lower middle income countries that are participating in Stride and beyond, that we need a lot of advocacy for resources for unpaid carers, particularly family members. And this is what Stride is trying to do is to provide. Uh, wonderful. Um, I uh, now think I need to draw this discussion to a halt, although there is quite a lot more questions. Uh, that are coming in. For everybody who has asked the question, we'll try and combine them and get the speakers to get back to you. Um, I would also like uh, uh, to answer briefly uh, one question. Um, somebody's asking whether the report includes public parks. Uh, the report includes a lot of material around the interaction between um, uh, care environments and parks and gardens as well. Um, so I do refer you back to the report. Um, there is a lot of questions which are uh, specific to a country. Uh, we'll try and answer those uh, in a culturally sensitive manner uh, separately. Uh, can I remind everybody that has asked that the report is available on our website www.alz.co.uk um, and can I remind everybody, this is completely free to download, but it's over 500 pages, so be careful not to send it to your printer before uh, ascertaining that you've got enough paper and whether you need to print it. Um, can I also please ask Annie to get to the next slide? Uh, before we conclude this webinar, I would like to remind you that in our conference coming in December, which is going to be a virtual conference, we are going to open a call of abstracts specifically on this report. So anyone that would like to put an abstract in around design uh, and dementia is invited to do so now. And now as the final uh, point, I would like to thank first and foremost all the people behind the report. And this includes uh, Chris Lynch, who has been the main person bringing the whole report to life and together. So thank you, Chris. He's not here with me in the panel, but he's definitely there with all of us in spirit. Um, Glenn Rees, who introduced us to Richard, without whom uh, this report wouldn't have happened. Um, and the whole team of ADI, in particular, Laura DeVas, Annie Bliss, and Wendy Whitener, who have been with me running this webinar. Um, for us, this is a very important day, as you know, and we really do hope that this report is going to be the first day of a new era where people will be taking on the lessons of this report to heart. Um, somebody in the question asked, what can we do? What can people that are not architect design planners do uh, in order to make this report a reality? Well, you can start by circulating it and getting it into the hands of all the people that you know that are uh, policy maker in uh, charge of planning, building, design, um, your Ministry of Health, people need to know that it is possible to make life of people with dementia better by simply um, doing better design. Also, please do circulate it in your own grassroots constituency. People can make very simple modifications in their home, and that will really act as a non-pharmacological intervention. Good design can do uh, very small but very significant little miracles. So we do recommend to all of you to implement uh, what is in the report. Uh, finally, I'd like uh, to remind you that uh, everything uh, will be available online as soon as possible. That's also going to be the slides. 
So thank you all. It has been very exciting to be able to bring to you this report. It's been over a year in the making. Uh, we uh, thank you for being with us until the end. And we wish you a very good World Alzheimer's Day and a very good rest of World Alzheimer's Month. Don't forget to use the hashtag, let's talk about dementia. Let's make it more than 12 million people. Thank you.